Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. My name is Corey, I'm with Avid CNC. Today we're joined uh, with Keegan from Dark Arrow. Uh, please let us know uh, how our audio is coming through, if there's any issues there. We've got the chat going live here. Uh, we'll be monitoring questions. We'll probably come back at the end for a more formal Q&A, but we'll see if we can get to them as we move through here. Um, I'm joined with Sammy and Keegan. Keegan, why don't you uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Keegan with Dark Arrow. Uh, I'm a, one of the three brothers on the team here. So it's myself and my two other brothers, uh, Riley and River. And we started this company a few years back. And uh, yeah, we've been going at it full time for roughly two or three years now. So fantastic. Well, what's Dark Arrow's mission? Yeah, so at Dark Arrow, uh, our mission is to build the fastest, longest range aircraft that someone can then build in their garage. So it's a kit-based aircraft, which means that you receive the aircraft as a basically a pile of parts. We wouldn't ship it as a pile of parts, but you get crates of carbon fiber parts and then you put it together almost like a Lego set. Um, and then once you get it assembled, you go through some um, flight test regimes and then you basically have your own airplane. And when you say fastest, what do you mean by fastest? Yeah, so it's a combination of speed and range. Uh, there's obviously aircraft out there that are faster, so we're targeting a cruise speed of 275 miles per hour. Wait, what but was then that? We have... 275? Say that again? 275 miles per hour would be our targeted cruise speed for the aircraft. So it's a two-seat configuration side-by-side, side, so a pilot and co-pilot. And yeah, you'd have a... Uh, a range of around 1,700 miles. Wow. Yeah, so that's pretty much up and down the West Coast uh, with one pit stop on the border, right? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of distance you can travel yeah. with that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I know you're a mechanical engineer. I like to hear about, you know, where people get inspiration to kind of do what they're doing now. When you were a kid, were you a Lego, Duplo, Erector set? Uh, Lincoln Logs. Yeah, uh, my brothers and I, and uh, we grew up on a small uh, kind of retired farmhouse, so we kind of had to keep ourselves entertained. We built a lot of tree forts out in the woods. Uh, my parents had a bunch of Legos that we played with. Our grandpa was an uh, aerospace engineer at Boeing, so we'd get dropped off uh, after school and hang out at his place, and he always had model airplanes and different things that he picked up um, from a yard sale that we had to put back together. So I think a lot of it stemmed from those types of activities when we're growing up. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Well, I'm very interested in, in uh, something I think you're very good at, which is machining carbon fiber materials. And so I was hoping we could get some tips and tricks for maybe some work holding, tooling selection, and then maybe some cam techniques for machining carbon fiber on one of our machines. Yeah, so uh, full disclosure, um, when we started the company full time, uh, the Avid CNC was one of the first pieces of machinery or equipment that we bought. And I think I spent a lot of time on the phone with technical support just getting it set up. So my background is not in machining. It's I, w I had an office job um, sitting at a computer as a mechanical engineer. A lot of it was just um, PowerPoint and spreadsheet. So there's definitely a learning curve for me learning how to machine and especially learning how to machine carbon fiber. Yeah. Um, carbon fiber is really tricky because it has so many variables to it. Um, there's different weave types that you can have. There's different epoxies that you could have with that weave type. And depending on how you machine it, it might react differently. Um, but in general, in general terms, it likes very high spindle speed and it wants a tool that is essentially going to grind it more than cut it. Mm. So you can get you can get a tool um, that has, it looks kind of like sandpaper wrapped around the end mill, right. if you will. Um, there's PCD is one of the most more popular ones, but they're very expensive. You can also use carbide um, with a coating. But that tends to wear out quicker. It all depends on what your budget is and 
uh, I guess what you want to accomplish the balance with it and how much carbon with fiber. the tool life and then yeah. the cut quality and the quantity of parts you have to make and yeah and we uh we spent a lot of time just experimenting with different end mills different feed rates different speed rates we had a whole spreadsheet going of what worked and what didn't work nice. yeah um, so i'm i'm hesitant to throw out like here's mm -hmm. definitely what you need to do because i'm guessing it would change based on what carbon fiber you're using um what your what your goals are for what you're cutting so there's just there's just so many variables involved um yeah but, well and I talk about variables as a big as a big factor in determining a feed and speed and observation after a guess, right? Because you have to start somewhere uh, with a guess and then you observe and try to refine refine that a little bit. And so it sounds, uh, you know, when we talk about, I'd like to focus on the chip that we're, yeah. we're asking the machine to create, but it sounds like we're creating less of a chip and more of a, of a shaving or we're, we're, we're shearing individual fibers. When I hear you say rubbing or grinding, we're not actually creating that that chip. We're, we're we're or we're the chip we're creating is very very small. The yeah, it's almost like a debris that you're creating. And yeah. one good uh, tip that I could give is that evacuate your chips or your debris as good as possible. So we have a dust shoe that's more of a generic dust shoe that we designed for plug machining. We ended up using it for uh, carbon fiber, which might have been asking too much. But in an ideal scenario, what I would do is I would have a almost like a compressed mm -hmm. airline directed at your end mill, making sure that that was blowing the chips out and then a vacuum line sucking as much of those chips back in and then making sure you have a really good HEPA filter for all of that. So all of the machining that we do out in the shop, we're very, very safety oriented when it comes to cutting carbon fiber. Uh, you don't want that getting in your lungs. So we actually have a little device that monitors the air quality we're out here and if it gets too it gets too bad we'll definitely open up the door or we'll pause our machining and we'll try to clean that air up and so, yeah. did i see that sometimes you put a plastic sheet around the machine to make a kind of pop-up room sometimes when you're machining yeah we we did that in the beginning when we were doing a lot of carbon fiber panel machining we had basically a little tent or a little cocoon for the entire uh router itself so a lot of the um air quality issues, if you will, were contained within that region. Mm -hmm. So we just had a simple box fan set up with a HEPA grade, mm -hmm. uh, one of those square filters, and that was helping to filter that air in there. So yeah. that was something we did in the early stages, but we have that taken down now because we're not doing as mm -hmm. much carbon fiber. Right, cutting. but that's kind of like an yeah. idea of if you're moving back and forth during materials, you have this pop-up thing that you kind of reach for as a tool. Sometimes when you're bouncing between different materials and knocking out different parts. Um, one of our uh, uh, content creators, Olivier, he's from France, has a question about, uh, do you only cut carbon fiber in thin sheets? I, I think that you have a variation of the different types of carbon fiber that you utilize, right? We do, uh, the majority of what we do is like 2D contour cutting. We've done some really basic 3D contouring on a very uh, limited uh, thickness. So the thickest that will go is around half an inch. And uh, yeah, I, I was showing this a little bit earlier off camera, but this is kind of one of the templates of what we've cut out for parts. So this is a half inch thick sheet billet of carbon fiber. And we cut a bunch of these small like brackets and bell cranks out of there. And some of them have some 3D geometry to them, but for the most part, they're, I would call them 2D shapes. And are you doing a, a fast and shallow type of pass or a slow and deep type of pass or, or a combination depending on the geometry? It's definitely a combination depending on the geometry um, and what kind of cutting you're doing. But for the most part, it's, um, I wouldn't call it fast. It's just given the materials and the epoxies that we use, um, I'm relatively slow, I would say, with the cutting. Or, so, and then what type of diameter uh, tools are you using? We pretty much stick with bread and butter. It's like a quarter inch end mill and then an eighth inch end mill for the majority of our stuff. A lot of our parts have pretty, um, pretty small radii, so yeah. we like to get in tight with the, the end mill. Um, in our earlier days, I definitely broke a lot of end mills trying to get 
more detailed geometries for carbon fiber. Yeah, and so with that quarter inch end mill uh, as a starting point, are, are you in the 100 inches per minute or 20 inches per minute? Where, where typically do you start when you have a new weave yeah. or a new epoxy that you're going to try to do some testing on? I guess where, where's the first place you throw the dart at? Yeah, we're probably in, in the range of like 60 to 80 mm -hmm. for our feed rate. Yeah. Cool. And then if we're doing panels, panels are a lot thinner. So yeah. we'll do uh, carbon fiber panels. That's like a thin sheet of carbon fiber. Um, and then you've got a honeycomb structure inside like aluminum or aramid. And then another mm -hmm. thin sheet of carbon fiber. You can rip through that a lot quicker than if it was a solid billet. That and you're going to go over 100 inches. And are, are you doing that, the top thin layer as your first depth of cut? And then are you going through the entire honeycomb as a, another tool path? pass or, or are you going full depth through everything in one pass? Uh, we've experimented with both. Um, I, it really depends on what kind of surface finish you're going for. Uh, it's hard. I will say, I won't say specifically what we do, but I will say it's very hard to achieve a good surface finish on the both the carbon fiber and the honeycomb if you're trying to go through everything yeah. right. at the same time. In the same pass steps because they're just react differently to the router bit. Oh, yeah, it's like you're cutting two different materials and asking them to have the same surface right. finish. Well, I think one thing that folks should take away from this is that you have uh, leaned on, you know, your spreadsheets and collecting the data and really looking at what has worked and uh, making adjustments on those variables and trying again and kind of repeat. And then you kind of become more comfortable to reach for uh, you know, those more proven cuts. Yeah, it's, I think machining in general is always this iterative process where you're trying to squeeze a little bit more out of what you did the time before. Um, I think anyone who starts looking at the numbers, you start, your mind starts racing, you start thinking, ooh, I think I could have done that faster. I could have arranged those parts better so the tool didn't pick up um, and run all the way to the other side of the machine to make that cut. So you're always thinking of ways to optimize it, um, whether that's your feed rate, your speeds, how you set up and orient your parts, how you did your tool paths. So mm -hmm. I don't. It's it's fun to me. It's fun to know that you can always keep improving that part of the process. Yeah, and I try to squeeze in little uh, bonus parts in material when I'm when I'm setting up tool paths like two, where I know it's like, oh, this is just a little. Uh, my dog likes to chase these plywood discs, and so wherever there's a four-inch little spot in, in a program, if I'm machining plywood, I try to machine these little discs because they're essentially free dog toys, and while while I'm there and machining, I might as well do it. And you get so, a little test out of it. Yeah. Yeah, we have these big uh, four-foot by eight-foot sheets that fit really nice on uh, the machine that we have. Um, so it pretty much fills up the whole table space, but we'll cut out a bunch of ribs and shear webs for the aircraft. And one of our challenges was to take all the excess material that was left and cut little uh, sample like coasters nice. out of it for customers. So it was fun squeezing those into different areas right. on Nesting the sheet. can be tricky. Yeah. Do you, I guess that's kind of uh, something I'm curious about is um, what your CAD CAM workflow is there. So like when you're designing and then laying out your parts, you know, how, where, where, what does your CAD CAM workflow look like? Yeah. So we all, uh, between myself, Riley and River, we'll all do a lot of the CAD work. Um, right now, all our CAD and design work is on shape, which is a hundred percent uh, cloud-based platform. And like we were mentioning earlier, our, our kit is, um, our aircraft is a kit design. So we have to provide instructions with that kit. So we have this ambition of having a lot of the CAD integrated in with the instructions themselves. And we want to host all the instructions online. So we see the possibility of having a really good kind of workflow there for the builder of having their, their CAD kind of integrated right in with their instructions. So we're really looking forward to that. Uh, piece of the instructions to improve on over kind of existing uh, kits out there. Um, but there aren't there aren't any good, um, I would say, direct workflows integrated in with that software yet for the CAM environment. So what we do is we pull 
once we have a design that we have finalized, we'll pull that uh, from Onshape and then we'll just pull it into Fusion 360 and we'll do all of our CAM work from there. Yeah, Fusion is, is a, a great program and the CAM um, environment is definitely something I think it makes sense for this workflow. Um, yeah, it definitely makes sense. Um, when you, uh, well, I guess this is, you know, we have similar business structures in uh, the fact that our machines are also kits and our uh, CAD designs are often, you know, pulled into our instructions and our instructions are hosted online so you can constantly adapt and update um, them to make it more accessible and, uh, you know, folks who are just interested in checking it out before they get it just so they can kind of understand uh, the assembly workflow. Um, it's a pretty cool way of doing it. So, you know, we see some similarities there for sure. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we're not, uh, we're not at the point of where you guys are, where you've got a whole customer base that you're supporting currently, and you're probably answering questions often about how to put the kit together. Um, but Anything that we can do to make the build experience more enjoyable, more intuitive, uh, kind of more plug and play, that's what we're all about. And I'm a very visual mm -hmm. person myself. I like to see things from all different angles. And in my mind, I have this, this idea of how uh, nice it would be to have the CAD right there to kind of look at if you need a different perspective on it. Um, so we see benefit in kind of having that integrated with the instructions directly. So. Yeah, I kind of think of instructions as, you know, the co-pilot on a rally car, where when you have a great co-pilot, the driver just gets to drive. They get to move forward with the process with confidence. And when your co-pilot isn't communicating effectively, you have to slow down in order to continue moving forward safely. And so when you have those great instructions, you, you really can move forward to the assembly. Um, and, you know, our goal is, is to help people with their machines and let them go through that assembly process without having to reach out to us if they don't need to. Uh, not to say that we're not here to help, but it's ideal if the instructions are to a level and our procedures and quality systems are to a level where you get to go through that build experience, you know, with a great co-pilot and you just get to keep moving forward and you get to that finish line really fast. Yeah, it's, it's super rewarding when you get a pile of parts and then you start seeing them like transformers come together into this thing that's going to allow you to make something. It's crazy, right? Like these parts, as they sit, you know, would not be able to do anything beneficial until you bring them all together in the right way. So uh, the build experience itself, I think most people just want to make. It is exciting to see something come together in front of you. Uh, so the more enjoyable you can make that process, I think the more benefit to your, your end customer. That and I feel uh, it, it really helps with momentum and in going into, okay, now that the machine's together, let's make some good parts on the machine. And when you have that momentum, right. it carries right into the machining practices. And whether you're brand new to machining and, and you know, uh, this is a first go at it, or if you're a seasoned machinist, or if you under... You know, uh, I talk to a lot of people who have a very good concept of machining, but haven't done it actively themselves. And those are some of my favorite people to work with because uh, it's like handing someone an instrument who understands musical theory, but haven't played an instrument. It's the learning curve is going to be shallow and we're going to be able to really bump up uh, uh, your capabilities quickly because you do have that underlying knowledge. We just need the experience and the confidence to hit the green button because we've checked everything and it's it's set up as we intended and here we go. Yeah, I think I think there's something special when you can get a machine that you use on a daily basis or you rely on um, for creating or doing and you have this fundamental underlying understanding of better understanding of how it works. You know, like if you get in a car and you have no foundational understanding of how the engine works or where the oil goes or where the washer fluid goes and you get stranded or if something happens or you need to help someone else, having that foundation to work from is really empowering as a, as a maker or as someone who's trying to create. Yeah, well said, well said. Well, uh, you're a trained mechanical engineer 
and uh, your brothers are electrical and aerospace engineers. Sammy likes to say, you know, making is a team sport. Uh, why don't you tell us about kind of how you, you, you guys have kind of put your team together and, and uh, why, why you might think making is a team sport? Yeah, uh, it's, I mean, it's interesting when we were kids growing up, um, like I said, we were on a, we we're kind of like a little bit isolated in a way. We didn't live in town. Um, our, we come from a very humble <laughs> um, upbringing. So we, not, not poor, but definitely lower middle class. So we kind of had to make our own fun with a lot of things. So uh, my brothers basically became my best friends growing up. Um, I didn't have a lot of best friends that I could go visit on a weekly or daily basis in town. So you kind of uh, develop a pretty tight relationship with them. And inevitably, you end up sharing a lot of the same or similar interests. Um, so one thing as we grew up that was always a constant is that we'd go to AirVenture in um, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, okay. world's largest air show. So that always kind of uh, drew us together. Um, even after we went to college and got jobs in separate cities, we'd always come back together and go to the air show together. And um, at some point, we all ended up back in the same town and we ended up spending more time together again. And Riley had been building his own aircraft, which was a plans built aircraft, which requires a lot more work, a lot more man hours. So River and I would come out there to help with um, his build. And, you know, you'd have some late nights out there talking and hanging out and um, going to air venture and just thinking about different things about how things could be improved or um, how they could be iterated on just you know it just happens I guess when you get three engineers um, together and you kind of look at the exciting things going on in the world with like Tesla or SpaceX or some of the things going on with 3D printing or you know seeing machines like Avid CNC out there and kind of thinking like a little kid, what if someone um, took these technologies that are more becoming more and more readily available to a guy in his garage and did something crazy like build a new aircraft yeah. with it? Um, so I, you know, and we as we talked about it more and we started look, doing more research on different machines, different technologies and different aircraft, uh, that's kind of what that was. There's this moment where we're like, hey, well, what if we try to do our own aircraft? Um, so I, we had different backgrounds that we could bring to the table. Um, I was wondering about uh, that. I think we made a spreadsheet for that. Uh, what, <laughs> was that was that a planned thing? Were you the three of you just like you know your brothers? So you have common interests of engineering, but then you know you all kind of want to do something slightly different than each other. So you picked different focuses, and then it just happened to be the perfect trifecta in which to you know do a project like this. Yeah, it's weird. Um, there wasn't any like secret master plan that brought this all together. It was <laughs> River was the guy who was always um, he was always the electrical mm -hmm. guy um, pulling computers apart. He built my mom's computer. Um, he was always the guy to go to to um, get something fixed on the like electrical side. So it, it was pretty clear like where what his path was or what he wanted to do. Uh, Riley had been sketching different aircraft designs since as long as I can remember. Um, and then I had always been building stuff as well. So it, yeah, there wasn't any secret master plan. It was more like we just naturally kind of fell into these different roles, I guess, based on our interests. Nice. Well, that's awesome that you could really um, each do a part, like the thing that you're passionate about and then have those uh, parts fit together uh, really well. So you can collaborate and and yeah. get to come together and then then it kind of turned into this business was it originally something like okay we, maybe we can build our own aircraft because we see all the kinds of things that we would change in this other kit and maybe we'll make one and then was it just like oh well, this is something other folks would like also yeah i think so we all had this like different aircraft are made for different mm -hmm. missions and we had this um Kind of this fantasy mission in mind for speed and range that we all um that we all kind of like liked we liked the idea of an aircraft that was very nimble but very practical and very optimized um you know there weren't any extra doodads or extra features on there it was kind of like 
kind of boiled down to its raw elements. Um, and we like the idea of that, just like really hardcore optimization. Um, and yeah, speed and range is, is a good a good mission for something like that. Um, and then another part of it was just the experience of, um, you know, helping Riley with his aircraft. Uh, I don't think a plans-based aircraft is a good comparison. That's where you, you literally get a manual in the mail and then you yeah. buy all the raw material. Wow. Um, this, so, so our, our plane is a little bit different where you actually get parts and you, and you bring them together. But I think it was just the, the frustration of trying to, to put a plane like that together. It was like, maybe there's, maybe there's some improvement to be mm -hmm. done there as well. Just for um, the genuine experience so. of it. Yeah. Um, someone, yeah. Uh, Sean Collins has a question. Um, as someone who's designing an aircraft in Fusion 360, do you have any tips for transferring it to a uh, traditional medium like 2D drawings? Um, yeah, so <laughs> I'll admit my, my design um, my design skills are more based in Onshape. I haven't worked a lot with the design in Fusion. Um, most of my most of my forte is in the CAM environment there, so I don't know if I would be able to give some solid advice on that. Well, um, it brings up a, a great but, point because I really feel like there's three different tasks in order to get a quality part off of the machine, and you have the design task. You have the tool path creation task, and then you have the machine operator task. And I feel like those are three very distinct, different tasks. And uh, you saying I don't do a lot of uh, design and fusion is a, is a very fair answer. Um, yeah, and it, I feel now that that question is being asked, I feel very spoiled in a way, because I think where the question is going is you're wanting to create these 2D drawings. I, I'm, I'm speculating, but when you create a drawing like that, you're essentially defining here are the mm -hmm. exact things that I need out of this part in hopes that you hand that off for someone to go make. Um, we're spoiled in the sense that um, given the fact that it's just the three of us and we have such a tight relationship, we can kind of discuss those things in a closed mm -hmm. loop. And because we have the full integration of the, the CAD work, the CAM work, and the machine in our shop, it's a very tight yes. feedback loop. So it, I haven't even thought about that question really up until this point, um, because so little of what we do is outsourced. Um, and, and again, maybe I'm off on that, but that's kind of where my head is going. Thinking yeah. about Yeah, well, and essentially in development or prototyping, that, feed, that, the, that feedback cycle being short and fast allows for you guys to be successful quicker, right? That's a great aspect uh, of your your model is that that feedback loop is short and, and you can iterate quickly and cost effectively. Yeah, and what's crazy is that when you what, when you have this machine, I think most people would think, well, that only has eight inches of travel, you know, and you only have four feet by eight feet to work with. How are you going to create the plugs for an entire aircraft that definitely exceeds the volume capabilities of that machine? And when you go like look at quotes for you know having a plug or a mold made out of house, there's just like no way. It's like no wonder people aren't right. doing this. But if you if you think a little bit creatively and you have these tools like CAD and CAM, and you get a little bit creative with it, you can definitely make it work on a machine like the Avid CNC. So I think that's a perfect segue. Olivia had a, Olivier had a question about what's the big bulge behind you on the CNC bed. Um, yeah. No, Sorry, no, that's ahead. yeah, yeah. He's just wondering what it is, and I think you just mentioned it. So, uh, yeah. So we do we do a lot of stuff on the CNC or the Avid CNC, other than just um, the carbon fiber stuff they were talking about earlier. We also machined out all the um, the plugs for the aircraft. So for those of you who aren't too familiar with what a plug is, it's basically the thing that you use to make the mold to make the carbon fiber part, um, which seems a little odd because you're kind of creating the plane like three times. Yeah. So this this one right here on the table is the plug for the uh, upper cowling of the aircraft. 
So obviously it didn't come off the machine like this. It was machined in, I think, five different sections that we then brought together to this final form. And then once we had that, we were able to pull a female mold off of it. And that's what we used to make the carbon fiber part. So you end up with usually a female mold. So like this is for our spinner. So we machined out the negative of this on the Avid and then pulled this off, which is just a combination of carbon fiber and epoxy gel coat. Uh, cool. And then once, once you have that, you're able to make a carbon fiber part off of it. So I have that part that we pulled off of that right there. So the little tip of that carbon fiber part is what came out of that mold. Cool. That's awesome. Um, so I, I'm wondering about the plug. So I know this is a very specific type of material on the outside. And I know it's, you know, it can be a, uh, can you tell us about what the material that you make the plugs out of? Yeah, the material itself is just called tooling board. So if you do a search for tooling board on Google, there you're going to have a million hits for a bunch of different, it's basically foam. And there's different density levels that you can get um, for that and a bunch of different suppliers out there. But it's basically, um, it's an engineered board, if you will, kind of like MDF. Only it's um, it's a lot more uh, it's a lot less particular about like humidity mm. and temperature changes. It's a lot more stable under those types right. of conditions. And out so, there, and uh, you're in Madison, is that right? Uh, and yep. so you probably have a lot of temperature changes between uh, winter and summer. So making sure you have a really stable material where those molds aren't going to uh, change over time is a really important thing. So that tolerance that you get out of your material specifically um, is going to add to your final product. Yeah, it's funny as you're saying that, and I'm almost embarrassed saying this out loud, but especially given that I'm an engineer, but I remember when we were shopping around for routers and we came across yours, the, the thing that we would look at is we'd scroll right to like, what kind of tolerances can I get? Or what kind of, um, you know, what kind of accuracy does it have? What's its precision? And you'd like nerd out on those values. And you, we had like a spreadsheet going with all these different CNC routers. And we're like, which one's the best? Only looking at those. And you'd hear stuff written down that's like, oh, well, it depends on the machinist, mm -hmm. you know, and it depends on how you set it up. And I'd always be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, what is the machine right. capable of, you know? Um, but it totally is this um, all encompassing thing. It depends on, you know, how do you set up your machine? How, how do you work hold? How do you set up your tool paths? Um, all of that goes into your final dimensions that you end up ultimately getting out of it. So the machine is important, but you can't neglect these other variables that definitely play a role. Right. That and I think just embracing the tolerances that you want to achieve. Like just because the machine can hold a certain tolerance doesn't mean that should be your effort as the operator um, because you don't you don't need to get to that fine of a tolerance um, potentially. Yeah. Exactly. I think you do talk about this in maybe your CNC setup part one or two, I can't remember, but uh, you talk about, you know, your spoil board is, is it HTPE or, uh, and, um, you know, you recognize that the machine is sitting on cement and the cement floor will change because of temperatures outside and you re-level and readjust every quarter uh, to accommodate for those changes. So knowing that, you know, the technician and uh, the setup of the machine has to be, uh, adjusted in order to get to those fine tolerances that you're looking for. Yeah, it's definitely um, something you can't neglect is you have to stay on top of like, what is your procedure for getting a good part. Um, so for every like, every plug that we're going to make on this on the machine, uh, in the actual when we're setting up the tool paths for it, we'll actually have information like what is the date? Uh, what is the temperature in the shop that day? What is the humidity in the shop mm. that day? Um, when was the last time you re-leveled the machine? That way you have all that information in front of you um, so that you're kind of armed with that going into the machining process, mm -hmm. which is also helpful when you're pulling the 
when you're pulling the mold off of it because you want the mold at those same rough environmental conditions as well because even with large temperature swings, after you machine it, it can still grow and expand mm -hmm. as well. So. Yeah. Can you tell us what you coat your molds with? The, uh, is that coated? Yeah, yeah this is just uh, this gray material that you see is basically just like a resin. It's just an epoxy gel coat. So it's um, just think of it like a, yeah, like an epoxy or like a, you know, when people, create those wooden tables and then they fill like a, a valley yeah. with uh, resin. It's, it's essentially the same uh, family, if you will. And then you put a, a, another type of resin in there with the, the fiber and then is it pulling uh, that gel coat out or? Yeah, so the, the mold itself, it comes off the machine and you're gonna have little, no matter how, what your step over is, you're always gonna have these little tooling marks. So I'm kind of going through the process here, but you pull it yeah. off the machine, um, you sand it to your desired uh, finish level, if you will, and then you put on a series of mold releases on there, and then you apply your epoxy gel coat, which is just mixed, it looks like paint almost. You paint it on there, you can use a paintbrush, you can use a roller, and then you lay carbon fiber cloth on top of that and then you build up a, a structure to support that um, and then you pull it off and you have your your mold essentially and then you do a mold release on your mold and then it's it's basically ready to make carbon fiber parts fantastic oh that's awesome so you have to do this kind of really hands-on workflow for most parts on the plane right so how do you kind of i guess uh refine your prototyping uh, process so you're not having to over to do this process over and over and over again in order to dial the parts in is there something preliminary step before you uh, cut the part you know do you put your um, uh, parts through simulation you know I'm not sure what you know I'm sure you have to uh, compensate for a lot of different yeah. loads and that sort of thing yeah so the the like going back kind of like mm -hmm. to the beginning a lot of it is based on um, analysis that we'll do on the computer and our our approach to the aircraft was to do the production tooling in parallel to developing the aircraft at the same time and that's just due to our our budget and our the size of our team and our and our timeline that we have to work with um but to get to that point where we're making uh, production molds and making sure that we don't have to redo them because they are so labor intensive, um, we actually just sm started with the smallest part possible. So uh, we basically made the horizontal stabilizer, which is like a little mini wing that sits behind the main wing mm -hmm. on your aircraft. We're like, all right, that's the smallest assembly on the entire aircraft. So to get an idea, if we can replicate this process for the rest of the plane, Let's start with that because it kind of has the lowest stakes in terms of material and time and, and manpower. So we made the first set of plugs for the horizontal stabilizer and we just tried a bunch of different things. We tried different cloths, different epoxy gel coats, different mold releases. We tried different machining setups. Um, I think one of the very first machining setups we did for machining out um, one of the molds or one of the plugs is we just pinched the material down on the table with like a set of two by fours because we didn't know what we we're doing. Um, but there was a huge learning curve that happened when we made the horizontal stabilizer. But from that, we learned exactly what we wanted to do for our main process so that we went to making the wing and the fuselage. We had that all dialed in. But when we made the horizontal stabilizer, we ended up remachining every single plug and remaking every single mold. Because by the time we got done with it, we had figured out, okay, this is working really well. It's getting a really good result. Um, we're going to replicate this and kind of sign it off as our kind of production process for making the rest of the parts. For yeah. It. So definitely start small and work your way up to bigger parts and make mistakes on the small parts mm -hmm. first. So, I mean, I was still learning how to run the machine when we were making the horizontal stabilizer plugs for it. So I had some awkward tool path transitions that happened in corners of the 
uh, the plugs that left some ugly tool marks in them. But yeah, it was a learning yeah. experience. Yeah, we, we, we've all been there. So uh, you're, you're not alone in that camp. We, we've, we've all had those experiences. I love to build off of, you know, the, the, those crashes of other operators from, from my knowledge base, but at the same time, you know, you, you do it long enough and you're, you're definitely gonna, uh, uh, you know, learn, learn some tool path creation techniques, uh, the hard way through, through a shift workpiece or a broken tool or, uh, uh, you know, a lost, lost tolerance. So yeah, very cool. Um, uh, I saw a picture recently of, of the wing with a bunch of cement bags on it, and you guys were doing some testing uh, on, on the wing. And tell me a little bit about kind of how you guys go through your testing procedures, uh, and are you making fixtures and jigs and these things on site? Is that part of the testing procedure is, is the fixturing and, and the, the jigs that you use? Yeah. we. So our aircraft fits into the, um, it's called the experimental category, which I don't know, that might sound really risky or really crazy, but it, it's just what they called it. But uh, in the experimental category, you don't need to meet um, the same FAA certification and FAA standards. Um, but what we do here um, is we try to follow them as much as possible. Um, so for the wing load test, that is, um, there's an FAA document that kind of tells you how to set up your test, how to check your uh, pass fail criteria and all of that. So for the wing load test in particular, we followed an FAA standard for that. And then we built a, we had to build up a test rig to properly hold the wing. So uh, a lot of the parts were machined out on the Avid to get the right angle for the wing. And then, um, yeah, just basically following a, an FAA guideline for setting that up for the test procedure, but and how, it's how kind many of bags same. of cement was it? Um, I guess it depends. We did we did a number of uh, different G loads, if you will, for it. Um, but some of the I'd have to, you know, I don't actually know. I was I was the one putting the bags on the wing. I was not the one recording <laughs> the data, so I'd have to go back and count on the actual wing itself. So. Yeah. Well, it, it, it looked like a lot of bags of cement. I've moved plenty of bags of cement in my life, and, and that looked like a, a, a good group of them. Yeah, it was. Um, I was not having to wake up early to work out that week. We, I kind of just relied on the, the load testing itself to handle that. Yeah. Well, uh, so not only are you making the molds, uh, but you're also potentially making the jigs. And this is one of the things I love about the architecture of a CNC router is, you know, these can make simple signs or cabinets or complex systems uh, or, or, or fixture components uh, for, for aeros, you know, experimental uh, aeros aerospace companies. And there's this spectrum of manufacturing capabilities that a tool like this brings. And I feel like that's this combination of achievable tolerance and, and work area. And I feel like you guys are, are, are really taking the, the full advantage of both of those aspects of this tool. And uh, yeah, no, it's really neat to see what you guys are making. Yeah, it's interesting. I think if you do a, if you do like a YouTube search or a Google search for Avid CNC, I think some of the top hits, you're going to see cabinet making, you're going to see planing of tables and other things. And I think it's, I mean, that's, I, w I want to get into that <laughs> as soon as we get done with the plane. Um, there's a lot of different cabinet designs that I have in mind, but I, yeah, don't limit your, yourself to just those things. If like, for us, that, that wasn't a deterrent that, you know, we didn't see other aerospace companies using an Avid CNC. It was, um, it was more of like, what are the numbers, mm -hmm. you know, like breaking it down more of like, emotionally disconnecting yourself from it like okay it looks like it has the right amount of area it looks like it has enough um or it looks like it has the right specs in terms of tolerance and accuracy let's you know there's no laws of physics that are saying that this also can't be used to do this other thing over here let's let's try it out 
is basically the thought process. So I think it's an interesting yeah. thing to look at the our customer base and how what a wide variety of processes are done on these machines. You know, the most publicized ones are going to be you know your slabbing and your uh, river tables or maybe some smaller aluminum parts on a Benchop Pro or something like that. Um, but I think when we get to bring things like your project to light, you know, uh, to you know our followers and anyone else who's checking this out is that it, it really can do whatever you want it to do. You just have to kind of figure out what your goals are and make sure you can dial in and customize it to be uh, the solution that your shop needs, right? So. Yeah, and I, I think the important thing, you know, we, we put together that little video about some of the mods mm -hmm. that we did, and I I wouldn't even necessarily call mm -hmm. them mods. I mean, the machine we basically set up, and it, for the most part, it was ready to go. Um, there are a couple little tweaks that we did, but yeah, I mean, it's fully capable of whatever it is you're looking for, um, whether it's wood or tooling board or carbon fiber or, yeah. Just yeah, yeah. I, I often formally give people a permission slip when the machine's set up, and that is, you know, this is your machine. It needs to be set up to meet your goals, and if that means that we need to reconfigure or add more work area or add additional cross members or reduce the, uh, the length of our legs to lower the machine bed, I mean, it is designed to evolve to meet your current needs, and that's one aspect that I will always circle back around on and say it is a long-term benefit because uh, in manufacturing, we don't necessarily know all of the tools we're going to need in a year or two, but knowing that this tool can be manipulated to meet those needs, I feel, you know, is another reassuring aspect that this architecture uh, presents a ton of value. Yeah. In fact, I contacted the Avid CNC team at some point because we were going to add another four feet onto the machine um, a couple of years ago when we were getting into making some of the bigger plugs for it. And I think the response was almost like, yeah, of course you could do that. But I remember at the time thinking like, man, I wonder if they're going to think this is crazy that I want to add some more length onto this thing. And they're like, oh, yeah, we have customers do that all the time, whatever. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, no, so, yeah. especially if you wanted to have a particular work holding area, like you wanted to add some vices or you wanted to add an area specifically for carbon that you had uh, better ventilation set up. So, so the machine would essentially go to that area and, and you could set that up. Or if you had a rotary system that was semi-permanently semi installed in an area, um, you know, that could be a dedicated rotary system. And so, yeah, having, having that versatility, I feel is a huge advantage. I was going to ask this at some point because I've always wondered, has anyone ever put two Z axes on one frame? Yeah. Like a so, hybrid, like two oh, machines? Yes. I've had two Zs. We've had two gantries. So uh, we had a boat builder uh, who, who ended up with an over 20 foot machine uh, that had two independent gantries. And so they could park one of the gantries when they had very long parts to machine. But otherwise, they actually ran it kind of as two separate machines that happened to be running on the same foundation. So yeah, we've had uh, a, a, a lot of different configurations. And if you have a custom configuration and you're interested, hey, can I do that? Please reach out to us because generally speaking, like Keegan, you're going to get this answer. That's yeah, we can do that. And and here's how you know here, here's what we can do to help you. And uh, uh, we 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 want to be we want to be helpful in those custom. The areas. two Z axes is a very common uh, modification. It, it's a uh, pretty standard now. I think a lot of folks use it in different ways. Uh, it requires an extended gantry, so you have it's slightly wider, uh, so that both Zs can get 100% coverage of your bed. Um, sometimes uh, you'll have a spindle and a plasma CNC, so you have half your table has a water table, half of it is a traditional, you know milling setup. So uh, that's probably one of the most common use cases. Um, uh, you'll see uh, on Tested YouTube channel, they uh, have a machine with uh, the dual Z. Um, we have a couple of uh, questions here. I just We'll just do a little lightning round, um, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, Izzy Swan, he's wondering if, um, if you can think of any other applications you might use that honeycomb carbon fi fiber material for, like, is there any other kind of common things that you, you see folks using it for? Yeah, 
it's pretty much in anything that you need strength and lightweight. So it's very common in air, aircraft. It's also very common in boat building. Mm -hmm. um, it's they use it as paneling in the walls for different type of commercial aircraft. They use it in the structures of of aircraft in boat building. Um, it also doesn't have to be flat. You can take that honeycomb and you can actually use it as a, as a core material um, and bend it and do different yeah. curvatures with it. So yeah, it's a very versatile uh, material. It, it doesn't even have to be for something as extravagant as a commercial airliner either. People use it in drones, um, RC, different RC projects, so. Adirondack chairs. <laughs> What's that? No, no. He's just joking. Izzy, Izzy Swan makes um has a really wonderful. She's designed hundreds. Anirondack Terra design, yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. Do you have plans to limit some of the current machining processes and replace them with molds in order to speed up part of the production? I mean, I guess it seems like you, uh, you know, making the molds increases the production, but I. I mean, I guess your smaller carbon fiber parts, it doesn't necessarily make sense to cast them. But what do you think about that? Uh, so the question was about like manufacturing limitations with the current number of right. molds? It's like, do or... you, well, it says, do you have plans to limit some of the current machining processes and replace them with molds in order to oh. speed up part of the production? Um. Yeah, so for some of these like smaller, mm -hmm. like little uh, bell crank items, we've looked at like 3D printing them, for example. Um, and we've actually, <laughs> we've actually done a cost benefit uh, breakdown for that. And actually what I prefer doing is getting one of your little mm -hmm. desktop CNC's, like the two foot by two this foot. One? Right because, here? Yeah, like that. Because these are also two mm -hmm. feet by two feet. And that way, uh, that machine could be fully dedicated and fully tuned um, and set up specifically for machining out uh, these little guys. Um, if you try to 3D print these or if you try to like cast them in some way, the cost actually doesn't work out as well as making one big billet in-house and then machining out a nested series of parts. So, But I think that one that you have behind you would actually work perfect for that. I don't need a uh, router the right. size of this to machine up two feet by two feet. So this one is could work really well for the four foot by eight feet panels. And then the little desktop one, I could see being in a, in a little enclosure. Mm -hmm. for, right. That'll um, definitely be good for your, your uh, air cleaning dust collection, particularly for the carbon fiber. Um, yeah. Create a little room for it, basically. Awesome. And, and I will say that um, not all parts fit into the um, the machining, well, <laughs> not all parts fit into the machining category. We do have some parts that are um, that are 3D printed, but you kind of just pick the process that has the best overlap of cost um, and then manufacturing capability. Mm -hmm. So just because you have a CNC machine doesn't mean that every part has to be CNC machined. And I think that's hard to wrap your head around at first when you um, get one of these. Everything has to be made on the router, you know, right away. But um, yeah. Well, and that's one thing that uh, I think Frank Howarth shows really well, and and Olivier now is showing well, where leverage the CNC and leverage the other tools in your shop, where they all present the most efficiency and ability to you know make a quality part. Uh, it's a combination of of all of the tools at hand, um, and not just you know going through just one. Yep, I agree. Uh, uh, we had a, a question here about the layup, Sammy, from mm -hmm. Rob. He said, assuming uh, the machining portion of your mold, all that, do you have any uh, uh, resources focused on the carbon fiber layup curing process that you might have used in your research or that you found to be really accurate for the process that you guys do? Um. I, so what we're doing actually is we're trying to build up that information for others. We've kind of been contacted um, almost daily about those types of things. Like how do you do your machining? How do you do your carbon fiber layups? How do you make your molds? And we're trying to build up our knowledge base on our website. Um, not trying to, I guess this is kind of a plug. Do it. Yeah. 
if you go to a knowledge base, we're building up that type of information um, just because we have had to kind of get getting those repeat questions like mm -hmm. that. Um, so, I mean, that would be a good resource um, in the near future. Uh, but as far as like layups, um, we don't specifically give out information on our layup schedule for the composites. But there's a couple good um, books. I actually have one of them here. Um, it's called Composite Composite Basics, and I'm I don't have it on me right now. But it's a little book like this big. Perfect. We'll find it and so, put in the link in the description later. Uh, that's good. Awesome. Well, it's good that you can rely yeah. on tons of online sources, and then sometimes go old school. You got to just get your. Uh, order your book online or something. Um, uh, Olivia is wondering if you also mill aluminum ever, or if that's a part a material you use. Uh, luckily, we don't have any parts that require us to do aluminum milling on the router mm -hmm. itself. Um, not because it's not uh, capable, but all of our parts that we need to do that are aluminum are done on our mm -hmm. Tormach CNC. Yeah, it makes sense. So, um, yeah. So we, so yes, we do, but not on the Avid. And, and uh, can can you give me a targeted chip load that you usually start with uh, on the Tormach um, for aluminum? Do you have a chip load that you typically type, try to target? Um, what do we target? Um. I can tell you, I typically am going for somewhere between two and three thou is the chip load that I'm trying to target for my initial, uh, yeah. you know, my initial test. Is that on your Avid? That's on the Avid. Yeah. Well, the chip load, whether it's an Avid or a Tormach or a Haas, right? When we talk about any of those tools, uh, all of those tools are looking for the chip that's best for the material. And so yeah. the tool doesn't necessarily dictate what the chip load should be. The tool will dictate uh, uh, your material removal rate and uh, potentially depth of cut, other things. Uh, but the chip load is more material specific. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that sounds pretty close um, to what we do as well. I was trying to think if it was between uh, three and five mm -hmm. for what we do. Um, I actually made a whole spreadsheet for that and with different materials. So that's also on our knowledge base if someone wants to check it out. Um, so. Awesome. Well, I guess folks are going to have to go and check out all of that information that you've collected and have, uh, you know, made, made accessible. Um, I think also when you talk about having the Tormach in your shop or having the Avid set up in a specific way or having the bench shop do a specific task, I think it's more about, you know, having multiple cutting heads and multiple work setups for specific processes. Uh, you know, because your time mark probably has a vice on it, something that's really makes sense to go ahead and put your aluminum on. Um, you know, if you had a bench shop, if you had a dedicated setup that makes it really easy to, to set up your aluminum parts, like it would make sense. So just having um, your different machines play different roles in your shop makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I, again, I had reached out, <laughs> I'd reached out to Avid CNC um, team at one point and I said hey we're looking at machining out some of these aluminum parts would it would it work out to get a couple of your you know your two by two mm -hmm. desktop routers to machine these out and they're like no that's probably not gonna fit your needs mm -hmm. and actually turned turned me away mm -hmm. to that so they're like yeah you'd probably be better off going with a mm -hmm. mill for doing that so it definitely yeah. depends on what your goals are and what kind of parts mm -hmm. you're trying to make and then what your volume what your volume is going to be as well right. So, yeah, we we, yeah. we we want to make sure, you know, as a kit based company, uh, achievable tolerances, you know, it can't just be for the perfect machinist. It has to be for, you know, uh, our entire customer base. If, if they do follow our assembly instructions and, and they use good work, hold to, work holding techniques and cam practices, it is an achievable tolerance. And, and uh, when we talk about certain types of tolerances, especially for aerospace components, they're just beyond what our machines are listed as capable. I'm not saying you couldn't get that part off of one of the machines, but um, you know there are machines that are 
designed to meet those tolerance requirements and that type of an environment. And we're always going to point you towards those when you come to us as, as with that being your goal. Yeah. Yeah. And in that sense, I think it was a lot of it came down to like the work holding and the rigidity of the machine based on the material that you're trying to cut. Um, it helps when you're trying to do uh, these larger structures like this and they're, you know, lower density. The machine and the material um, act together a lot better with that when you have a larger surface. Yeah, totally. Well, uh, yeah, please go check out Dark Arrow, whether you're interested in their knowledge base or you're interested in putting a deposit down <laughs> on one of their beautiful, long range, extremely fast aircrafts. Uh, I'm excited for you guys to continue moving forward and maybe someday I can find myself out uh, in your neck of the woods and, and sit in that co-pilot seat and, and get to turn my knuckles white. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much for being with us today. And uh, we, you know, it's just so cool to see the capabilities that you've uh, achieved and the materials that you've, uh, you know, kind of helped expand a lot of our ideas of, of what you can use and the kinds of tolerances you can achieve. Um, so we really appreciate that. Yeah, thank you guys, and thanks for having me on. And you'll have a YouTube Fantastic. channel. I've linked, linked uh, some videos in the description. We'll be sure to link that book as well. Um, I will say next week we do not have a live stream because we'll be at Vectric User Group. Uh, so if you're interested in attending Vectric User Group, it's a worldwide conference. Uh, it's online, um, mm -hmm. and I hope you all can join us. Uh, we'll be giving a couple talks about um, advanced toolpath strategies in uh, plastics and plywood, and as well as uh, brass and aluminum uh, next week at Vectric User Group. So I hope you all can join us. Uh, Keegan, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you soon. Yeah, and uh, Dark Arrow has a phenomenal YouTube mm -hmm. channel. Uh, so please go check out their YouTube. They're, they're showing uh, both builder tips and tricks and also just the journey of this, this aircraft. And so uh, go check out uh, Keegan and Dark Arrow's YouTube channel. It's, it's very interesting stuff. Yeah. Thanks, Corey. All right, everyone. Bye. See y'all. Thanks, Sammy. Thanks, Thank Corey. You.